So I have a question for you today. Do you want to know him? Like not just know about him, not just know his word, but really know him, personal relationship. Do you want to know him? A.W. Tozer once wrote, I have often wished that there were some way to bring modern Christians into a deeper spiritual life painlessly by short, easy lessons. But such wishes are in vain. No shortcut exists. God has not bowed to our nervous haste nor embraced the methods of our machine age. It is well that we accept the hard truth now. The man who would know God must give time to him. The man who would know God must give him time. The church that would know God must give him time. Jesus said, this is eternal life, that they may know you, God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Paul said, I consider all things worthless compared to knowing you. Scripture says all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are found in Christ. Knowing Him is everything. Not knowing about Him, having an intimate relationship, His Holy Spirit inside of you, knowing Him for who He is. I remember years ago when I read that quote by Tozer, my heart just broke as a pastor because I was like that's what I've always longed for too and I've always wrestled with like how can I come up with another series or maybe a devotional or maybe a, 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 a discipleship study that can just give somebody take them from zero to to you know fully mature in the faith and 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 I've been frustrated and the reason is there's no way to do that the people that I know that know God the best, that love God the most, who are the most mature Christians, who really get it, who are the real, real deal, they've done a million studies, they've read the Bible several times, and, and how they've come to know Him is, as, as Eugene Peterson said, it's just a long obedience in the same direction. It's over years of just getting to know Him and spending time with Him every day. And so knowing God is everything, and as Tozer said, the man who would know God must give him time. The church that would know God must give him time. And uh, we've come into a special season this year as a church of knowing God in a greater way through his Holy Spirit. We've made that more of a priority in our church family. And that's what he wants. Because as we've talked about over the last few months, the Holy Spirit is the literal presence, the literal spirit of Jesus in our midst. He wants that relationship with you and me and with our church and so we've been growing in that this year and we did revival back this summer and we saw God do a lot of awesome things and after revival um, one of our staff members said she was talking to a friend and and they said you know how are we ever going to go back to church as normal after revival and and she said maybe we don't have to and that's really what our staff and leadership team have been sensing is like we don't want to we don't want to go back to church as normal where we all get into a routine and we we are like got our hour and 15 minutes and i hope this is done in time so that i can hit the Bengals game or whatever's coming up because i've got stuff to get to today we we don't we don't want to do that because we want to give him time we saw god do a whole lot in revival a whole lot not just whatever it was, 70, 80 baptisms, but I mean, many people healed, many people set free, delivered from demonic oppression, many people filled with the Spirit, some for the first time in their lives. It, it was phenomenal. And this sense is, we, just prophetically speaking, the Lord's been saying, it, we're coming into a new rhythm as a church, and we've been praying into that. And it's connected to this idea 
And we want to be a church where every single Sunday is quote unquote what most churches would call revival. Where, where we worship the Lord. Where we give Him time. Where we give Him time. And if you want to see God move in greater ways in your life, it's usually directly proportional to the time that you give Him. And so putting all that together, we've been talking about this a lot as a, as a leadership team and staff. And we've come to a decision and we want to let you know about that today. Starting in two weeks, November 20th, uh, we're going to be changing our service times. Uh, we're going to still have two services on Sunday morning at 845 and 1115. And what that's going to allow us to do is have a little bit longer service. So we've been having about shooting for an hour and a half. Um, now we're going to extend it to about, Lord willing, about two hours. Um, we still have to have a half an hour for parking because parking, you know, y'all know how parking is here. Especially if you ever come second service, you're like, oh. <laughs> so uh, we need a half an hour for parking. And so that'll give us a two, hour, two hours for a service and a half an hour per, for parking. And we're really excited about it. As we give the Lord more time on a Sunday morning together, we're going to see him move in greater ways. And uh, we're, we're super excited about that. And so we'll be starting that in two weeks. So two weeks from today, November 20th, new service times. It'll, you'll see it on social media in your email. And, uh, and we're going to have a little bit more time together, which we're really excited about. And um, just be praying about that. Be praying for that. Um, we're starting our new, re or, whew, our new Wild and Free Kids uh, system today where... Um, April Goodrich, our kids pastor, said, you know, if we don't have a two-hour service, they're not going to get to do everything that, that they're meant to do. And so God literally gave her this, this way of doing kids ministry where they not only have a Bible lesson, but they're going to get discipled in the Holy Spirit gifts and prayer and, and so worship, all the, all the things. And so we're, we're going to be raising up kids who have experience in uh, the gifts of God as well as His Word. It's just so, so exciting. So I'm going to read our scripture for t today, and, uh, and then I'm going to pray, and then I want to preach a message to you. The title of my message today is, Only One Thing is Needed. Today's a reset. God's giving our church a heart of worship today. Only one thing is needed. Luke chapter 10, 38 through 42. This is the NASB version. And there's several words in this passage that could be translated many different ways. And I, after sitting with this all week I decided this was the version I was going to use today but I'll explain a little bit of it as we go verse 38 it says now as they were traveling along he Jesus entered a village and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home she had a sister called Mary who was also seated at the Lord's feet and was listening to his word but Martha was distracted with all her preparations. And she came up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do the serving by myself? Some of you know what it's like to pray this way to the Lord. Don't you care that my spouse has left me to do everything? Don't you care that my kids have left me to do everything? by myself then tell her to help me verse 41 but the Lord answered and said to her Martha Martha you are worried and distracted by many things those words worried and distracted could also be translated fearful troubled upset so she's worried stuff's not going to get done. She's fearful, but now she's getting angry. 
because she feels that pressure, the pressure of life. It's not going to get done. There's so much to do. And I feel the pressure and I'm worried and fearful. And so now I'm starting to blame and say, it's because these people and, and Jesus, don't you care? And he's saying, listen, you're worried and upset. You're distracted by many things. Verse 42, but only one thing is necessary. That word necessary could be translated needed. It really means only one thing is essential. There's a whole lot in life. Many things are going on, but there's one thing that is absolutely essential. It's necessary and needed. For Mary has chosen the good part, meaning the good portion. In our modern English, the way we would say this usually is, Mary has chosen what's better. She's chosen the better portion. She's chosen what is best, which shall not be taken away from her. Let's pray. Jesus, we're so worried and distracted. We're so fearful, troubled, and upset about so many things on so many days, Jesus. <sighs> but only one thing is needed. Only one thing is necessary. Only one thing is essential. I pray, Jesus, that you would show us the one thing today. Open our hearts to the one thing. Would you just give us the grace to know how essential the one thing is? us a heart of worship today to be a people who no matter what is going on in our lives we would seek the one thing to sit at your feet to hear your word to worship you every single day of our lives God I just pray for a divine reset an impartation of a heart of worship a spirit of worship to love you to want to know your word, to want to know your heart, to want to know your spirit more than anything else, to want that for our children more than anything else. We just ask for this today, God. could one day like Paul say I consider all things rubbish garbage dung <laughs> compared to knowing you Jesus compared to knowing you we want to know you Jesus so God we open our hearts today and we invite you to rebuke us correct us <laughs> God, we repent of any prayers we've prayed that were selfish prayers, blaming prayers, thinking we knew better than you, trying to get all the Marys of the world to help us with all of our things that are unnecessary. <laughs> yes, God. We just repent right now. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Pour out your love into our hearts. We love because you first loved us. So I just pray you would remove all fear from our hearts today as well. And all anxiousness. And all anger. And just 
in its place, I just pray that you would impart peace and love, God, so that we can sit at your feet daily and just know that you, you've got us and you're going to take care of any of the needs in our lives so we can be a people who are all about worshiping you, sitting at your feet, people who are all about the one thing. And everybody who agreed with that prayer said, amen. All right. Can you guys thank Wes for playing guitar for us? <laughs> you know, I happen to think our very existence is a miracle and we take it for granted. Um, I was reminded of this or really, I, I should say I got that revelation when uh, we had our first child. Um, I remember my wife got pregnant with our oldest daughter, Isabel, and I was 21 when she got pregnant. I still played video games. I cried. I cried when she said that she was pregnant because I literally was like crying and I was like, I still play video games. I can't be a dad. And I wasn't joking. I was dead serious and uh, just was not ready for that. And, you know, reality sinks in. Her belly started growing. And it was like, there's something in there. <laughs> yeah. And so, but you, you people who are parents know that you see the belly growing, or I should say for the men, this is true for the men. Nothing really changes till the day the baby's born, right? Now the women, you, you start getting sick. You start having weird cravings. A lot of things start changing for you. You start feeling, think, I mean, that always blew me away, like, I would ask my wife questions like, is it weird? Like, there's a, there's a creature in there <laughs> moving. It's like a human being is in your stomach. Like, that is, isn't that weird? Like, that would be so weird. And um, it, it's, it's miraculous, you know? But for the, us guys, you know, life goes on for nine or ten months, and you just see your wife's belly getting a little bigger, you know? She sleeps a little more. She's a little crankier at times, she's <laughs> nauseous at times. <laughs> Pickles and cheese was my wife's go-to. But other than that, until the day the baby comes out, it's just kind of like, that's when it hit me, at least. The day she was born, my wife goes into labor, we get to the hospital, she's in labor for several hours. And we get to the moment of, of the birth. And finally, the, the nurses bring the doctor in. Now, our doctor i got to paint a picture for you. Our doctor was a, an older guy, Dr. Rojas, a Hispanic guy, almost retired when we had him for our first, and has done, at that point, had done thousands of deliveries. So I'm a 20, at that point, 22-year-old young man, who this is my first kid, and I'm just like, what is happening? You know, he walks in, and I kid you not, he was like the sloth on Zootopia. <laughs> he just like... It's like 7 p.m. at night. He's like staying after his shift just to deliver this one last kid. He does not want to be there. And, you know, we check. The baby's crowning. We're ready to go. He gets in there. He sits down in a chair, and he goes, okay, push. <laughs> like, literally, he just doesn't care. He's like, I've seen this a million times. This is not miraculous to me. Let's get this over with so I can go home. That's what he was thinking. I know it. I'm just sitting there like, what's happening? So my wife pushes. She gives one hefty push, and I'm not kidding you. The baby starts coming out. Now, what I expected to happen was for the baby to come out, you know, slide out, fly out, however they come out. <laughs> he receives, and then, you know, the baby's here. That is not what happened. What happened was my daughter's whole head came out and stopped. And I was like, what's happening? And I was like, and it, it stayed this way for about 30 to 60 seconds. It now it seemed way longer than that. I was having flashbacks to a kid, that old movie Alien. I don't recommend watching it. But you know, like the scene where like, you've probably seen the trailer at least, right? Holy people. And like, there's... <laughs> An alien bursts out of the guy's stomach, right? It's like, wow, you know? And you're kind of like, whoa, that's nuts. Well, that's the same feeling I had 
when I see a head come out and stop. <laughs> she doesn't start crying because her lungs are still crushed in the birth canal. And <laughs> she starts moving her head. And I'm like, right there. I'm like one of the stirrups, if you know what I mean. And I'm watching, and I'm looking at this head, and it... And the doctor is like, I'm just like, scared. I feel like I'm in the movie Alien. And the doctor's just like, takes a little suction thing, and he's suctioning out my daughter's nose and mouth. He's just taking his sweet time. And I'm looking at her, and I'm looking up at my wife, and my wife's like, like, what's, like, what's happening? You know, she's not looking, she's just kind of like, what's happening? And I'm looking at her, and I'm looking at my daughter's head, and I'm looking at her, and I'm like, and I'm just thinking, there is a head sticking out of my wife. <laughs> now, some of you who've been in a birth experience know what I'm talking about. This is disturbing. <laughs> Miraculous and disturbing. And finally, after an eternity, he gets done suctioning. He goes, okay, push. <laughs> One more push, and she, my daughter comes out. You know, they clean her. She starts crying. They put her up. And I was, I was overwhelmed. <laughs> I mean, things happen on the inside of me. Emotions I never felt before. Things breaking open, you know. Like the fa a father's love, just poof, things are happening. Soul ties are being created. You know, I don't, you could be the worst person that ever existed and ruin your life and I will still love you. You know, it's just like, oh my God, you're so beautiful. Like that stuff was happening. It was such a miracle. You know what I'm saying? Like it is miraculous. Human life is miraculous that someone could get pregnant and... How'd that baby get there? You know, like a, a seed was planted and where'd that come from? And where'd that come from? And where'd that all the way back? And it's, it's a miracle we're here. And then there's a, a human being growing on the inside of a woman. And then one day it comes out. I mean, it's, it's a miracle. Do you know what I think is an even greater miracle than that? that the God who breathed the stars comes and lives inside of us. Yes. We as Christians so often in our secular, humanistic, atheistic culture, we think this is like a metaphor. The spirit, anything spiritual is a metaphor and it's not reality. It's reality. He, he comes in and, and by the way, this miracle of miracles, this did not happen pre-Jesus. He never came in. He didn't, the Father did not make his home inside of people pre-Jesus. That's something that Jesus bought for us on the cross. That's something he made possible. This, this miracle of miracles. And then he comes in and, and new, you become a new creation on the inside. You get reborn. And, and then he brings gifts, new gifts of the Spirit come out. And any of you ever use a gift of the Spirit, like prophesy, you prophesy over somebody? I've had this happen a few times in the last week or two where I'm just like, let me pray for you. And I start praying, and all of a sudden, stuff starts coming. I get a download, and I pray something out. And I'm like, this is God. God's saying this. And I just watch the person go, oh, how would you know that? Only God knows that. And they just start crying. And I'm like, I did it. This is amazing. And they're sitting there going, God is in you. And he just came out. And I'm like, I know. It's weird for me too still. It's a miracle. Miracle of miracles that God lives inside of us. What a miracle. And so, what a tragedy. What a tragedy. When the God who breathes stars comes to live inside of us only to be ignored. I 
I think so many American Christians are like Martha. It says she welcomed him into her home. She opened her home to him, and he came in, which means she believed in Jesus. She loved Jesus. I like this guy. I want to help him in his ministry. I want to see this kingdom he's talking about come. I really believe in this. I like him. And so I'm going to invite him in. And he comes into her home. And then she promptly ignores him. And she gets busy about all the other stuff she has to do. Can you imagine if Jesus showed up in the flesh today? In this room. And we were like, it's Jesus. It would be like if a celebrity, right? Why we like, oh my goodness. Like, holy cow, that's amazing. You know, Jesus was at church today. And imagine he walked in and he went, I'm coming to your house today, Zacchaeus. As soon as we're done here, I'm coming to your house. And you were like, oh, I didn't clean. Oh, boy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and so he rides home with you in your car. And you get there and you go into your house. And you're like, hey, Jesus, I'm so honored that you chose me, that you came in. You know, this is, I'm welcoming you in. This is my house. Hey, make yourself at home. I'm so glad you're here. But, like, I got to work tomorrow, and I got some stuff to do. There's laundry that needs to be folded. You know, I got to catch up on some other things, some emails before work. So make yourself at home. You know where the fridge is, right? You, hey, feel free to watch some TV. You know, check it out. Um, and uh, if you need anything, I'll just be in the other room, just holler. Can you imagine? I think he would be offended and stunned. I mean, he would be sitting there going, I don't think you realize before the cross, I didn't come into people's homes. I didn't come into their hearts. I think he'd be sitting there going, I, I paid my blood to be able to come in and spend time with you but you're too you're too busy you're too busy we are too busy with so many other things that word distracted it says Martha was distracted by many things by all her preparations another version says she was distracted with much serving and that word in the greek there for distracted i wanted to clarify this because in our culture it we get distracted 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 like like add like squirrel you know like anybody ever been reading your bible on your phone and you get a notification from a social media you're like oh what's that you click it it's like a squirrel video and you're just like oh squirrels oh next one oh next one oh shoot there went all my devotion time Anybody? Anybody? Squirrel. The word distracted here does not mean squirrel. It doesn't mean short attention span. It literally means she was too busy. In other words, she had a lot of work to do. And she was busy doing a lot of work, actual work. And because she was too busy, she was distracted from Jesus literally being in her home, literally being in her life. And so, I felt like the Holy Spirit wanted me to tell you something today. He misses you. He's in you. He's waiting. But he's like, you're never home. (laughs) You're so busy out there doing everything for everyone, doing stuff for yourself, spending time on things that you think matter. But the reality is you're, you're missing the one thing that is essential, that is needed, that is necessary. He misses you. He wants to spend time with you. And this is for some of you today. I don't know who this is for. It's for some of you. For some of you, he wants me to tell you today. He's jealous. And he's hurt. Because he's jealous 
of how much time you spend on things of the world versus with him. He paid the cross with his blood to live inside of you. And some of you don't give him the time of day, except for an hour and a half on Sunday. Some of you, you're, che you're cheating on him with the things of the world. James 4, 4 and 5 says, this is his word. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he caused to dwell in us? He, his spirit in you is jealous for your spirit to know him and he's already in you and he's just waiting how do you get to know someone you got to spend time you just got to spend time with them some of you are like i don't know how to pray i don't know how to pray and you've been saying that for years we went over to the phoenix center this this past week and it was a we did a little church service they asked us to do a church service several months ago we went over there and it was awesome. We sang a few songs. I preached a little bit. Several guys gave testimonies. And before we went, we had a couple guys we knew that were going to get baptized. They were ready, and they wanted to make that decision. I don't know. There was probably 50, 70 guys that came out and were a part of that. 23 of them gave their lives to Christ and got baptized. It was awesome. And I noticed one of them was praying, helping pray over the guys that were getting baptized after they, he was praying over. And afterward, I said, hey, you know, thanks for helping pray for these guys. And I was talking to Matt Lute, and, and he told Matt at one point, he goes, Matt's like, why don't you jump in here and help pray? And he goes, I've, I've never prayed for someone before. And Matt's like, well, how do you pray on your own? And he was telling me, he's like, you just do that for someone. <laughs> and he's like, oh, okay. So he started praying. It was awesome. You know how you learn how to pray? You, you do it. You spend time. You stumble your way through. You do that. Some of you catch on in a month or two. You're, you're pretty good at praying, you know, talking to God. Some of you, maybe that's not your jam, but we're all called to it. And maybe it takes you two or three years. But you still learn how to do it. It just takes time. It takes time to know him. It, it, the Bible's a big book. It takes time to know his word, his story. It just takes time. He's jealous for us today. And so the question becomes, why don't we? Like, like I know most of us in this room feel this message right now. I know there's been seasons in my life, you know, where it's like, oh, I've been drifting. I've been getting busy. I haven't been putting the time in. I haven't been spending time with it. I've been praying as much. Like, we all feel this message, and we all get convic convicted from time to time. So, so why does this happen? Why don't we give him time? I don't think it's because we're nefarious, evil people who don't like Jesus. I think we have really good intentions. Just like Martha, like, hey, come on in, yeah. We have great intentions, but good intentions don't equal right action. And right action is what leads to change. Faith without deeds is dead. And love unexpressed goes unexperienced. You can feel all the love in your heart towards someone else. But if you don't express it, if you don't tell them, if you don't do an act of kindness, if you don't give to them, if you don't serve them, they have no idea what you're feeling. God's the same way. He wants to experience your love. Whew. That is the meaning of life right there. To be able to love. Why is there pain, suffering, and evil in the world? Because God is love, and he created all of us to be, not just to receive love, but to be able to love back. And the prerequisite of love is free will. Because a gift that's demanded is no gift at all. And if you didn't have the choice, we'd be robots. 
So he gave us total free will, which means we could choose other, we could choose different, which we did. And he started a process of redeeming us by his great love. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We love because he first loved us. This whole life is about learning how to love. That's what it's about. It's about this side of the cross learning to receive God's love and this side of the cross learning how to give God's love. That's it. But love unexpressed goes unexperienced. So we've got to put our good intentions into action. And like Martha, we're just so busy. We've just got so much going on. And sadly, because we're so busy, and it is the parable of the soils, the, wheat, the weedy soil, he said, because of distracted by many other things and the deceitfulness of wealth, it's an affluent culture where there's a lot of other good options. That's the culture we live in. That's Laodicea. That's why they were lukewarm. I'm rich and wealthy. I don't, ha- I don't need a thing. And they were partaking of all the good things of God, but they weren't partaking of Jesus Christ himself. And so their faith was lukewarm, and they thought they had everything they needed. They were affluent. They were comfortable. They were giving time to all the good things, but they weren't giving time to him. And guys, that's the culture we live in. I know inflation is big, and I know we're entering into a recession, yada, yada, but we're still extremely affluent. And there's so many other things that will take your time and your priority. I heard a story a few years ago by a Christian missionary. To, he was a, a missionary to Muslims. And um, he, he was talking to a Muslim friend of his. And he said, you know, he was kind of inspired and yet convicted at the same time by how faithful Muslims are to a false god. You know, from his perspective, right? This is not even a real God. They're, so, they're way more faithful than we Christians are. Like, if you don't know about the Muslim faith, like, Muslims pray five times a day. They fast an entire month of the year. Like, in a lot of Muslim cities in the world, there's a public speaker, loud speaker system where they put on music and a guy's voice comes on, and it's like five times a day. Hey, time to pray. And they play music, and everyone stops what they're doing and prays. Five times a day, every single day day and he was blown away by this and he said you know why are you all so faithful to your god like what like you're and he was honest with him like you're you're more faithful than most christians i know to our god why why is that what causes this faithfulness in you to spend so much time praying and doing all these other things and this muslim man proceeded to draw a circle on a piece of paper And I put up my own rendition of this up here. Uh, Do we have the circle? Yeah. He said, you Christians. He drew a circle and he said, this circle is your life. And then he drew a dot in the middle. And he said, this dot is your God. He's a part of your life. And then he drew another circle the same size right next to it. And he said, for us Muslims, this circle is our God. This is Allah. And then he drew a little dot in the middle. And he said, and this is our life. And then he explained it. He said, for you Christians, your God is a part of your life. For us, he's everything. He is our life. I remember hearing that story. And I was convicted and inspired by a Muslim man's faith. Because I went, uh, hundreds of not dozens, we'll say, of scriptures raced through the, my mind. That we are to live our lives in Christ. That Jesus said, if you abide in me, I'll abide in you. And that word abide, it means to dwell within. It's the same word they used in the Greek for a baby inside a woman's womb. Like, we're supposed to live our lives in Christ. Like, like Paul said, I no longer live. Christ lives in me. I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. Christ lives in me. To live is Christ. To die is gain. Like, 
Romans 12 too, take like, like this is your spiritual act of worship. Offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God. Your whole life, lay it before God as an offering. That's Christianity. That's what he wants. That's what he paid for. And the truth is, so many of us have a lot of problems in our lives, and we struggle with a whole lot of things. And, and, the, and then we pray and ask God, and it doesn't seem like it makes it better, and we wonder why. And the truth is, it's because Jesus is just a little part of our life, and he's not everything. And until we make him everything, some of those problems aren't going to go away. And when we make him everything, sometimes the problems don't go away, but our worry and our fear and our anxiety and our depression about the problems goes away. So either way, our biggest problem is when he's not everything. And so that's what he's wanting today. And so I have a question for you. Is Jesus just a part of your life or is he everything? Well, how can you tell? If Jesus is just a part, or is he everything? Here's another question. Do you arrange your whole life around Jesus? Your whole life, your whole schedule, the time you spend daily on certain things, do you arrange it around your time with him? Or do you arrange your whole life and schedule and then maybe just fit him in where you can? which doesn't happen to be that often sometimes for some people. That's how you can tell. The man who would know God must give him time. He wants time with you. He loves you. He's jealous for you. This is prophetic. This is a word he gave me this week. A time is coming and has now come when God is calling us, as for me and my house, our church family, to rearrange all of our lives, our schedules, our hobbies, our desires, our family schedules around him. Around what he wants. We were praying about this in our staff meeting. Monday I was anyways, and um, the spirit of the Lord came on me. I started weeping, and I was, I started prophesying. I said, this Sunday is going to be a reset. He's giving us a heart of worship. He's giving our church a heart of worship. Worship is not just singing a song. And if you don't mean it, if you're just watching the band sing a song, it's not worship. You're watching other people worship. If you're thinking about, oh, they're looking at me, or oh, what if I raise my hand? You're not worshiping yet. Worship is when you're just focused on him. And I'm going to sing this song to tell him, how much I am grateful for the cross and for all the other things. That's worship. Worship is, is, it just means service. In the Hebrew, it just means service. I'm going to serve God. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey what I say. You'll obey my commands. If you really love me. He said, you're, a, you're my friend if you do what I command. You know, the moment you get saved, you're not automatically a friend of God. This was a a revelation God gave me a few years ago, and it kind of broke my heart, but then it was like, well, I guess I found what I'm living my life for right there. I want to be his friend. Friendship goes two ways, and God is my friend. I want God to be my friend, and I can bestow that on him. You're my friend. I consider you my friend, but for him to call me friend, that's something he bestows. And he says in his word, you are my friend if you do what I command. At the end of three years of living every day with Jesus, the end of that, right before the cross, he looked at his disciples and he goes, you know, I no longer call you servants. I call you friends. But for three years, they served him. And apparently he called them servants for three years. Because he's not just a person. He's God. And so he's like, I'll find out if you love me, if you obey me. 
So you can be his child, you can be saved and going to heaven and still not be a friend of God. He's looking for lovers. He wants lovers. And you can sing the coolest song ever, but if you go out and don't live for him in every decision you make and the way you live your life, you're not his friend. You might not even know him. So he wants us to rearrange our whole lives around him. I'm not going to break these down, but I think there's three. This is a whole other 30 minutes to this message. But there's three main areas in American life that steal our affections for him. We have good intentions, but we let these things get in the way. It's entertainment, including TV, social media. It's our kids' hobbies, activities, and sports, and our hobbies, activities, and sports. And it's materialism. And so real brief, I had like another half an hour's worth of breaking all that down. And I'll let the Holy Spirit convict you and break it down for you. But the average American spends three hours a day watching TV and three hours a day, over three hours a day on social media. When smartphones came out, they thought TV usage would go down. It didn't, not really, just minuscule. So we didn't, they thought it'll go down and people will be on their phones all day. No. We've just added being on our phones all day to watching TV for three hours a day. And let's be honest, most of that content is not edifying our relationship with the Lord, is it? It's a distraction, most of it. It's like sweets. It's good in small doses. But too much honey will make you sick, the word says. He, taste and see that he is good. Kids, hobbies, sports, and all that, man. Arrange their schedules around him. Arrange their schedules around him. I will read this, I guess. I won't break it fully, break it down, but according to leadside.com, there's about 1.1 million high school athletes participating in 26 sanctioned school sports. Of those, each year, about 853 will eventually one day go pro, which means your child has a point zero 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 seven five chance of becoming a professional athlete, but they have a 100% chance of standing before the throne of God. So if, if we teach them, if we teach them to keep their eyes on the ball, but we don't teach them to keep their eyes on Jesus, then we failed as parents. I'll let you, do, I'll let the Holy Spirit convict on you how to arrange, but I know what I would do. It's not going to interfere with church. And you're going to know the word as, much, as, as well as you know any sport. Those are my convictions. And there's things to do to make that happen. And then materialism. I love, I'll just quote Dave Ramsey. We buy things we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't even like. And... Uh, it's just not necessary to have a brand new car that costs 50 grand and then work a bunch of overtime to try to make the payment. And then we complain and we hear, you know, oh, my kids are in five sports. I'm gone every night. Can you believe this? I can't. I have no compassion for people when they complain. I go, you're the parent. Make a different decision. Limit, limit. Tell them they can do one sport. Like, it's not difficult. Say no. Being home is valuable, you know? You don't have to have a brand new car, you know? I won't go into it. I'll let the Holy Spirit convict you. But we're going to spend some time as we close today. I'm going to ask the band to come back up. And we're just going to enter a time of responding to what God's doing today. And um, As they're getting ready, I will say this. God wants a pure bride who loves him back. He's looking for lovers. And our church in particular, it has been prophesied. We have a great destiny. (sighs) 
He's promised us a, a great move of his spirit. But just because he's promised doesn't mean it's guaranteed. God's promises are conditional on our obedience. You can go check scripture. There's a lot of ifs in there. <laughs> if we submit to him, if we surrender to him. So he's promising us a great destiny, really special, but it's not guaranteed. And God won't pour his spirit out in a greater way on idolaters. He pours his spirit out on a greater way on worshipers. Do you know what idolatry is? It's not atheism. Idolatry is when we believe in God, and we worship God, but he's just a part of our lives. And we make something else an idol. It's over him. We choose it over him. And so in the Old Testament, that was literally, they worshiped God, Yahweh, but they had another God that they were worshiping over him. Scripture says greed is idolatry. We think we don't have idolatry in our day and age because in America, at least, we don't worship these other gods or other religions alongside of Jesus. But anything that's taking precedence over him becomes an idol. He won't pour his spirit out on a greater way on idolaters, but on worshipers. Because he won't pour his spirit out on a greater way on people who will grieve it, quench it, or fail to steward it as the precious gift that it is. So he's calling us into a season of consecration, preparation, entering into a season, a lifestyle. It's not a season, actually. It's a, life, it's a whole new lifestyle. It's a whole new lifestyle of fasting things of the world so we can have more time with him. It doesn't have to be a total fast. It's just putting them in their proper place. You don't compromise church. You don't compromise obedience. You don't compromise your calling. Every single person, he has a calling on your life. And some of you just come to church and listen and go home and then go do your life. And you don't even know what it is because you've not asked him, you've not sought him for it. It takes time, spend time. And so they're gonna sing a song. And I just ask as they sing this, just let it wash over you. And I just felt like some repentance needs to happen in this place today. And repentance is not a feeling word. It doesn't mean you feel bad, it means you change. And so he's not here, he doesn't wanna shame anyone today. When he brings things up, he doesn't bring them up to shame us, but to set us free. And so as we sing this song about having a heart of worship, I believe the Holy Spirit is gonna convict some of you. He's gonna convict all of us if we're listening on different areas of life, rhythms of life, family schedule things, work schedule things. And he's gonna highlight some, like you just need to make some changes because he's preparing our church to do something special. And if you're a part of our church, then you're gonna be a part of that but he wants a prepared body. He wants worshipers who he is our one thing, he's our everything. And we fit all the other stuff in life in where we can, but we're solely focused on him. That's Christianity. That's Christianity. He wants every church to be that way, but we're not responsible for other church. We're responsible for us, amen? I'm not responsible for you either. You're responsible for you. So I'm doing my part, he's doing his part. And so think about what he's calling you to today. If you want to come up front and worship and kneel down and spend time with him, you can. If you want to make your seat a, an altar and, and kneel down at your seat, if you just want to sit there and just think, if you feel led to sing and give him your whole heart through this song, then do that, okay? Praise God. Deeper within, through the way things are. 
ask the Lord, Lord, what changes do I need to make? What changes do I need to make to make you the priority, the one thing? And so just leave today with that question in your hearts and minds. We're going to keep playing. If you need prayer, our prayer team's available. Come on up if you need prayer. If you want to know Jesus, forgiveness of sin, to know you're going to heaven, come up and pray with one of our ministry team members. They're on the sides of the room. If you need healing in your body, if you've just not been feeling yourself struggling with depression, anxiety, we found very often there's, it's not just you, there's a spirit behind that. And we can help pray and get that off of your life today. So come up and pray with our, our team if you need it. And everyone else, you're dismissed. And uh, go get your kids. And in two weeks, we'll have more time. We'll have more time. We'll have more time. Amen. God bless you guys.